because I need to get in my agile, get in my agility. All right, today we are going to learn about agile. We're going to go left, we're going to go right, we're going to go back, we're going to go forward, and we are going to score big goals. But that's probably not the type of agile that you're thinking of. See, my name is Amber Vandenberg, and uh, as stated before, I am the founder of the Pathways Group, and we help teams become more agile, whether that be in sports uh, or actually. Uh, embracing agile methodologies within their teams. Now, where did the conversation of agile actually begin? When do we start being agile within our companies and within our organizations? Uh, we actually begin by being very agile in our nascent beginnings. In fact, there is a psychologist named Bruce Cuthman, and he writes that all teams go through uh, cycles and they go through stages of a team. See, first, whenever we go into a team, we begin in our forming stage. We all come together and we form. And then we take a dip in our performance and we begin storming and asking ourselves the questions. How are we going to operate? What are our approaches? What are our methods? What are our mindsets? What are our processes? And as we go through these conversations and ask these questions in the storming phase, then we establish certain norms and how we are going to operate. And this forming, storming, norming stage allows us to catapult into high performance within our team. And so whenever we are beginning our projects, whenever we are beginning a company or an industry, uh, this is the pro this is the process that we go in through but that is so i'm going to hang this up but there is one last portion of tuckman's model see there aren't just four stages there are indeed five see we cannot always stay at this high performing level eventually we need to adjourn and ask ourselves the questions what is going well we do some value engineering and what can we do a little bit better and so we take a dip right here and we go through that adjoining stage and in those adjoining stages whenever we're asking ourselves those questions we actually cut through the norms and enter in back through that forming and storming stage so that we can catapult even to a higher level of uh, performance and so as we go through this forming, storming, norming stage, we can actually continuously grow and we continuously get higher every single time that we go through this cycle. So in 2001, the, it's almost as if the entire industry uh, went through a very big retrospective and we all gathered together and we asked ourselves the question, what is going well and what are some things that we can do just a little bit differently? In 2001, um, developers gathered in Utah and they established the Agile Manifesto. Now, the Agile Manifesto really is four basic concepts. See, the Agile Manifesto states that we want to put people over our processes. It states that we want to put a working software over documentation. It also states that we want to have customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And we also want to respond to change over following a strict plan. And this is the simple Agile Manifesto. Now, we've just begun our conversation. I'm only a few minutes in, and I am about to commit a bit of Agile heresy. Now, hear me out. I propose, what if we considered the possibility of altering our manifesto just slightly, and rather than having people over processes, 
we actually had people that were owning our processes. We had people own processes. What if instead of working document working software over uh, documentation, we had working owned documentation? And what if instead of customer collaboration over negotiation, we had customer collaboratively owned negotiation? And then lastly, we're not responding to change over following a plan. We're responding to change of a plan that we own. And this changes the conversation ever so slightly. And here, we're essentially reassessing who is in the driver's seat. I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of time in this quarantine season walking around my neighborhood five million times. And one thing that I've noticed is some of my neighbors are walking their dog, and sometimes the dog seems to be walking them. It's really a sense of who is really uh, in control, who is owning the steps and the processes moving forward. And this is a slight paradigm shift that we can make within our, um, within our approach to Agile. Again, it's asking who is in that driver's seat. Now, in this COVID time, I have not only taken many, many walks around my neighborhood, but I've also uh, spent some time with my family and with my little sister. We actually spent some time working on this Play-Doh creation. Uh, so we actually spent a lot of time discussing how we were going to make this, how we were going to get the edges just right, how we were going to get the right colors. Uh, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of work. We tried really hard to make this Play-Doh structure. But the reality is, is that if I simply hold on to this structure, I'm very proud of it, but if I only hold on to it, then eventually it's going to get a little hard. It's going to get harder to adapt to change. It's going to become outdated. It's going to become irrelevant is going to become a little crusty. And sometimes whenever we come into new organizations, we hear the stories, we hear the work that has been put into uh, creating the perfect process that was perfect 30 years ago. But if we do not continuously change, then we too will become outdated, will become harder to change, become a little crusty. See, our job in organizations is not to hold on to what has been created. In fact, our job is to mold and to continuously create something new. You might think, well, that sounds all good and fine, Amber, but how do I actually enact change? How do I help my organization um, embrace Agile? How do we apply this um, outside of, of development. How do I enact this change? Well, see, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to become the only American, uh, the only female, the only Christian, and the only blonde academy football coach or soccer coach for the Adidas Game Day Academies and Paris Saint Germain PSG Academies in Bangalore, India to coach widely the first generation of athletes on both an elite and a grassroots level. I coached about a dozen teams, mostly boys with a few girls. And as I joined the team, I noticed that our academy was operating under a very strict command obey dynamic. Oftentimes, our players would come to sessions and they would stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for instruction. And they would come to our sessions and they would stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for direction. And while they, this may have been the most efficient way to teach a task, in a game scenario, it was a disaster. Oftentimes our players within the course of a match would kick the ball perfectly, exactly the way that we had taught them. And then before the play was over, they would turn to the sideline to the coach for further direction and feedback. See, they have mastered the task but they didn't quite understand how it applied to the overall game scenario. Well, it might be easy to think of this as a foreign academy in sports with kids. How often do we go to work 
receive a task and wait for instruction. We had to alter the way that we were developing our players so that they could perform at a higher level to achieve our desired outcomes. This is a different type of development. And the first thing that we had to do was not a dramatic shift. It wasn't anything, um, it wasn't a complete overhaul. We actually made a slight shift. And so rather than commanding, uh, commanding how to kick the ball, we actually clearly communicated the what and the why, and then provided opportunities for ownership within the how. An application that looked a little something like this. Rather than stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for instruction, we provided challenges. So from here, kick the ball to knock down those three cones. Because in order to do that, you're going to have to kick with power and precision. And in a game scenario, whenever you pass, whenever you kick, whenever you shoot, you're also going to have to kick with power and precision. From this, I saw some of the most heated debates I'd ever seen among seven-year-olds trying to decide if the best way to kick the ball was with the infoot or with the laces. In reality, both ways were right. And so from this challenge, we were able to expand our toolbox of resources from one way of kicking the ball to two. And we had more tools in our toolbox to perform at a higher level and to reach our goals. Now, there were some aspects of the game and some aspects of football that we could not change, but I found that there were at least four opportunities for ownership that we could provide for our players. And these four opportunities for ownership oftentimes make up the uniquely better aspects of a team. In fact, these four opportunities for ownership oftentimes make up the competitive advantage of an organization. And these opportunities for ownership lie within our processes, our methods, our projects, and our roles. See, we had opportunities for ownership within our processes. Which cone were we kicking down first? The first cone, the third cone, were we going for a strike? What was our process? What is your process of communication? What is your process in your retrospectives, in your stand-ups? What is a way that you can provide unique value and be uniquely better in your processes? Uh, that's an opportunity for ownership. We looked at our methods. How were we kicking the ball? With the input or with the laces? What are the methods of development, your methods of design, the methods of ideation that you can be uniquely better uh, within your team and within your organization? We looked at our projects. This could be something as large as a match, but it also could be within our development, within our training, uh, our warm-up drills, our stretches, picking up the water bottles. Uh, this was different projects that we undertook, these undertakings that we had within our team that made us uniquely better. And then we also had opportunities for ownership within our roles. Now, roles doesn't always have to be position. Sometimes I have people come and they ask, they say, Amber, how can I implement Agile if we don't have a Scrum Master? Well, see, the role of a leader, the role of somebody leading the charge doesn't always have to be the position. You might not have the position of a leader uh, in a leadership role to embody the role of the leader. Uh, you can have a role as a devil's advocate, a role as uh, the jokester, uh, the role as the gatekeeper. What is the role that you are playing within your team to provide unique value? Take it a step further. What unique role is your, or is your team playing in your department to add unique value? What role is your department adding in your organization to add unique value? And what role is your organization adding in your industry to provide unique value and how does that come back to you and your specific opportunities for ownership now we recognized that we had individual opportunities for ownership within our processes our methods our projects and our roles but we also recognized that 
a single person, a single player could not win a match all on their own. And in the same regard, if we want to embrace agile within our teams and within our organizations, you cannot do it all on your own. In fact, if you can achieve your dreams all on your own, then you're probably not dreaming big enough. If you want to do something bigger than yourself, then you're going to have to include more than yourself. And so in this, I'm actually going to give you the unique opportunity uh, to actually go into the comments uh, and we have the opportunity to meet other people and include more than ourselves in this conversation. So if you want to go in the comments, I encourage you, you can drop your Twitter handle or your LinkedIn account and we can begin making those conversations and making those connections today. And so you can begin, uh, yeah, including that within your uh, within the comments. And in reality, this is something that happens very often within in-person uh, conferences. See, we go in and we meet a lot of people and we hand out our cards. And sometimes it can be tempting to say, hi, my name's Ember. Here's my card. Hi, my name's Ember. Hi, my name's Ember. Hi, my name's Ember. Hi, my name's Ember. Oh, my goodness. And I become a little bit out of breath. Uh, and at the end of the day, I've met a lot of people. Uh, I have a lot of cards. I might even have a lot of connections. I might even know a lot of names. But I have names. I might not have uh, the actual stories behind that. So I encourage you, we're actually going to take this one step further. Uh, now I encourage you to, and now I'm going to ask you to do this twice, to go into the comments. This time you can put in your Twitter handle, put in your LinkedIn account. We can be begin building those connections now. And I encourage you to give a short sentence of who you are, what you're working on, what projects you're working on. Uh, for me, it would be Amber Vandenberg, founder of the Pathways Group, international speaker. That would be uh, you know, something short and sweet about myself. Amber Vandenberg, I am working on developing X. And if you're like me, I'm kind of looking at the uh, at the chats here. Uh, sometimes I can scroll through these chats and sometimes if I'm meeting people in person, then you're going through this filter of asking, well, what can they do for me? So, oh, that's that's Susan in HR. I the, we don't really have a lot in common. I don't really know what we would make from this connection. I don't know what she can do for me. And maybe you're a better person than I am, but this is the question that I know is tempting to ask quite often of uh, looking at people in, in from a point of view of what value they can give to us. And so uh, I encourage you uh, as we're building these connections to actually take it one step further. Because that's not genuine relationship building. It's looking at a relationship through the lens of an ulterior motive. And so I encourage you to follow up those conversations. If you send me a LinkedIn request, you'll probably get this uh, follow up conversation asking, hey, let's have a 15 minute coffee chat to actually get to know one another and have a meaningful conversation and actually genuinely, truly build relationships. See, if we want to enact change, if we want to bring the people over processes, we must first actually build relationships with those in our teams. And then after we've done that, it's important that we clearly communicate what we're doing, and why we're doing it in a clear manner. One of my favorite authors, Dr. Mark Rutland, he writes that all communication boils down to four pillars, and that's the right message, the right way, to the right audience, and the right time. I'll say that again. Great communication boils down to the right message, the right way, to the right audience in the right time. And in my leadership positions, whenever I have succeeded in great communication, generally I have completed all four, uh, been successful in all four pillars. And if I have missed communication, uh, it's generally one of those areas that I have missed the mark. So what does all of this have to do with Agile? How have I actually used this in implementing Agile within my team? See, uh, a couple of years ago, I was working with an HR department 
And they had grown from a team of five to a team of 23 within a year. So that department had um, more than quadrupled in size in a year. And the processes and the methods and the approaches that they were using um, as a team of five were crippling the department in a team of 23. There was massive miscommunication that sought to be corrected through mass documentation. Uh, there was multiple people that were looking at uh, multiple different uh, applicants. And so the applicant cycle time from the time that a person applied to a time that someone was hired for an entry level position was three to five months. There was mass frustration. There was um, a lot of double work being done. And so we began the conversation by looking at what we could own. What do we want to do? Why is it important? What are, we, what are our opportunities for ownership? And so we started looking at our processes first. And uh, we actually implemented a Kanban board to look at, okay, who is who is in who has been interviewed who has been offered who has been uh, who is in negotiations and we started building this uh, a very simple process within our application we actually split our teams up into micro teams so rather than having eight to nine people working on a single service line we had smaller teams that could operate more efficiently be more agile and have more cross functionality we also implemented stand ups so that we could have clear communication and also uh, help us take control over our documentation. We were able to work over uh, spending six hours weekly per person and documentation, uh, six to eight hours. Um, and so from this, we were actually able to implement this and really improve our cycle time from three to five months to three to five weeks. And we are still continuously working to improve that even more. But these simple ways of embracing agile, uh, these simple agile methodologies within our team allowed us to operate more efficiently and more effectively. But you don't just have to be in for-profit or in business to implement agile outside of development. In fact, I was working with a nonprofit organization, an international organization that had a huge heart for helping people and uh, really making a difference. But the problem was, is it wasn't exactly scope creep. I prefer to call it scope invasion. Uh, see, they had one, they had five projects that in the course of six months had expanded to 73 different projects and initiatives. And so the focus was looking a little something like this with every single project uh, being done very sparingly. Uh, it, there wasn't allowed to have full focus on any of the projects, so none of them were getting done, and uh, there was a lot of frustration. And so we actually took all of the projects and we put them into a backlog, and then we designed sprints so that we could have our full focus and actually complete each project. And then at the end of each project, we had a retrospective, and we asked ourselves the questions of what went well, what can we do a little bit better? And so not only were we completing our projects and we were gaining that momentum, but we also were improving so that we could be better for the next project and we could be more efficient and more effective with the next project that we were taking on. And this allowed us to help more people uh, to actually have the energy and the focus that we needed to truly make an impact um, in in our society uh, with the nonprofit. So uh, whether or not you are in for profit or a nonprofit, you can implement agile, but the possibilities do not stop there. In fact, last year in a, in a time that we could travel, I actually had the opportunity to travel with a group of my friends to Thailand for a month. Now, all of my friends we all lived in different parts of the United States, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, South, we, we lived all over. We had different, various different professions. We came from different backgrounds. And this was a fun opportunity for us to actually go to a different culture and experience something grand. Now, you can imagine with all of those differences, there was a lot of planning. There was a lot of planning. 
And we wanted to make sure that we had ownership of our plan. We actually had to make sure that we had ownership of our plan and that we could be adaptable to change, especially whenever we missed the bus and the train. But we did not miss a flight. And so what we actually did at the beginning of every day of our trip is we uh, began the day with a daily stand-up and we began asking ourselves the questions. What do we want to do? Why is it important? What are our opportunities for ownership? And we began being able to make a plan uh, that way. We also had a retrospective at the end of every day. And so rather than doing this at the end of the trip, we actually did it at the end of every day so that we could have a faster feedback loop so that we could make the adjustments that we needed. So by the time that we were in our final week uh, on our holiday, it was very different than the first week because we had been able to openly discuss and make the adjustments that we needed so that we could be more effective, so that we could be more efficient and that we could really enjoy our time. Now, I've given you a lot of information. Uh, we've talked about a lot of different concepts and a lot of different applications that you can use to apply agile concepts, whether that be in business, in nonprofit, or in your daily life. And these are things that you can use to score big goals. And speaking of goals, I'm reminded of one last story. See, whenever I was in India, I had a young lad named Achintya. And Achintya was six years old, and he was so excited for his first day of football. And so he came running out onto the field, and he began yelling, pass, pass, pass. And I noticed that Achintya was yelling pass, even whenever the other team had the ball. And he was yelling pass whenever he was miles away from the action. And he was yelling pass even whenever he had the ball. And so he was running with the ball, yelling pass, pass, pass. And so I looked up at Achintia and I said, Achintia, why are you yelling pass? And he looked up at me and he said, Miss Ember, I do not know what it means. I only know it is a football word. And sometimes it can be easy to sound like my friend Achintia. Sometimes I hear leaders sound a little bit like my friend Achintia, yelling, stand ups, retrospectives, backlogs, agile, we got this. Because we know that these are really good words that can lead to big goals. But if we are in the wrong position, if we're miles away from the action, or even if we have the ball and we don't know in which direction we're going, then saying these words are not only ineffective, but they're actually detrimental to our overall communication within the team. Eventually, the team is going to tune you out. But if we first take the time to build genuine and true relationships with those in our team, if we take the time to ask the questions, what ask the questions of what and why, why now, why this method, asking and clarifying what we want, why it's important, and then provide opportunities for ownership within the how, within our processes and our methods and our projects and our roles. And we clearly communicate the right message in the right way to the right audience at the right time. Then, we will be in a position to yell pass, to receive the ball, to move forward, and to score really big goals. Thank you so much for having me today. Again, my name is Amber Vandenberg. If you have any questions at all, uh, here is my Twitter handle. Uh, and I'm also available on all the social medias. I'd love for you to reach out. So uh, thank you so much for having me today.